Thank you. Uh, first off, good afternoon. Good evening. Afternoon, evening, right? But uh, first and foremost, I want to let you all know it's an extreme honor and privilege to be here before you all. This is actually my first time speaking in Utah, so this is, this is pretty cool for me. I've always came through on like a connection flight to somewhere like Seattle or Albuquerque or somewhere like that. And so, Sean, thank you for that. I greatly appreciate it. I also want to extend my gratitude to Sean, to the leadership. Thank you guys so much for affording me this opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. But I want to, I want to explain to you guys the video that you just saw, what that is. That, that was a trailer that got did by ESPN, and they went on to produce a 30 for 30 short film that ended up doing extremely well. And so one day I was at home with my wife and my two children. I got a seven-year-old son, eight-year-old daughter, 11 months apart, little Irish twins. Give me a run for my money every day of the week. And I'm just hanging out, having some family time, and the producer calls. And I pick up. He says, Ink, what are you up to? I said, man, just hanging out, having a little family time. He says, well, I need you to take a seat. I got some news I want to share with you. And so I took a seat. I said, what you got? He said, do you remember the film we did? I said, of course, man, great experience. It was awesome. Forever indebted to you guys for it. He said, well, it's nominated for an Emmy. I said, man, that's pretty cool. He said, it's a big deal because this is the first time we allowed an athlete to narrate their own film, and it got nominated. I said, man, let me go in the kitchen. I want to share with my wife, right? And so me and my wife, we've been at it since fifth grade, right? Puppy love. So it's a good thing and a bad thing, right? Because she knows everything about me, right? And so I go in, and I'm stoked. And I say to my wife, I'm like, babe, you're not going to believe it. The film with ESPN, it got nominated for an Emmy. And she was like, oh, okay, whatever. I was like, no love, right? She, <laughs> She's like, yeah, whatever, right? I'm like, bump that, right? I go back in the other room with my children. And so I'm competitive, right? I've played four sports my whole life prior to college. I'm ultra competitive, right? And so I say to him, who are we up against? I want to win it. I want to bring it back to Atlanta, right? And the first name he says is Muhammad Ali. I said, we lost. <laughs> He's like, no, nah, ain't you got a shot. I said, I'm telling you right now. We're losing, man. He said, they want to fly you to New York. I said, no need. We lost, right? And it came out. We ended up losing, but it was all good. I got nominated, right? <laughs> and so I'm a guy, man. I, um, I appreciate every facet of life, right? But I also believe life is the best classroom. And so I'm very cognizant of the situations, circumstances, and I firmly believe, as Sean stated, the one thing we all have in common as people is we all will face some level of adversity. And so something pretty cool happened uh, last week when I was in Seattle, and I'm going to get to that. But first, I want to explain to you the card that I have in my hand. In my house, I have a bowl, right, and I call it a quote bowl, right, because I believe it's very important before you start your day to set the environment, to set the mood, because you can get up and just start running, and then you run out of the door, life hits you in the face, and before you know it, you woke up, you were on top of the world, and now the world is on top of you. And so every single morning, me and my kids and my wife, we go to this bowl, and we grab a quote card and we read it right and we put it in whatever bag we have and we take it out of the door with us and when I travel I keep them with me as well and today the quote says do the best you can until you know better then when you know better do better by Maya Angelou right that's my gift to you Sean can't ever say I didn't give you nothing man right <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was in Seattle and a guy came to pick me up uh, last week and you know when he picked me up it was it was around midnight and so we probably said maybe three or four words to each other. It was late. And when we got to the hotel, I thanked them. And he said to me, I'll be the guy that's coming back to pick you up in the morning to take you to your event. We talked about the time. I said, okay, cool. I'll see you in the morning. And so when I came down the next morning, guy stood outside his car. We spoke. We get in the car, and we're riding for five minutes. And I look in the mirror, and I can see the guy is crying. And so as I'm sitting in the back seat, I say to him, is everything okay? And he shakes his head kind of like, man, like, like you're not going to believe it, right? And he said, my normal job, I don't drive, but my buddy owns the company. And he said, whenever he gets overwhelmed, he might call me and say, hey, man, uh, can you cover a shift for me? And he said, usually I'll tell him, no, nah, I'm cool, right, because you meet people and sometimes it's just not the situation. And he said, I hadn't drove for him in probably 11 months. And he said, for some reason, when he called me yesterday, I was like, cool, I'll take it. 
And he said, I looked you up after I dropped you off, and I saw this video about redirection, right, at 3 in the morning. And he said, it gave me purpose. He said, but the reason I'm crying is because I just lost my wife, right? And when he said it, I thought to myself, like, how do you smile after that? Right, because I know every single day I look at my wife and what my wife means to me. And even when I lost my grandmother, I thought to myself, would I ever be able to smile and laugh again? And so I posed a question to him. How did you get up and simply put one foot in front of the other and walk out of the door and continue your routine? He said, well, I got two daughters. He said, before I get to that, I want to tell you something because it wasn't like it was all good, the whole process. And my wife had been sick for over 30 years. Right. And he said, we got to a point in the sickness to where we hit a rough patch. And he said, she would scream at me. I would scream at her. And I felt as if I was trapped in a situation and the creator knew I couldn't leave the situation. And so I would say to the creator, you know, I can't leave. And my wife is sick. You know, I can't go anywhere. You know, I can't leave her because she's my wife and I can't go anywhere. So I got to sit here and I got to deal with it. And I resented the situation. I resented my wife. I resented the adversity. And we found ourselves in a point to where I ended up leaving. And he said, I went to stay with one of my buddies and I'm in the mirror one morning and I'm brushing my teeth. And he said, I'm saying to myself, right, for better or for worse. Yeah, things have gotten pretty worse. For richer or for poor. Yeah, we're pretty poor. And he said, through sickness and health. And he said, he stopped and said, man, I haven't finished. And he went, he packed his bags, walked out of the door, got back to his house. When he walked in the door, he said, his wife said to him, what are you doing here, you prick? And he said, he said to her, I'm going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. He said, so either we can figure out how to make it work, how to deal with it, adjust, or we can sit here and we could just be miserable and mad because the situation has happened that's out of our control and we didn't expect it. Like, I believe in life, you got two separate people. You got champions, right? And they go through things in life that are self-inflicted. They bring it upon themselves. They get through it. They say, man, I got through it. And then you got warriors, right? They walk outside, the wind hits them, knocks them down, they pick up their stuff, they adjust and they get moving and they deal with the adversity that they didn't expect. They set their perspective right and they figure out a way to embrace it and add value to every environment that they go into and every person's life that they come in contact with. And he said when he walked in the house and he said it, he said an amazing thing happened. The environment shifted and him and his wife, whole, whole situation changed. And I said, if you could do one thing earlier, what would it be? Like, I, I'm more concerned with the thought process of a person. Like, when a person says something or does something, I want to understand what was your thought process and what brought you to that place. Like, with my son, he plays basketball, right? He's seven years old, right? And so I know everybody in here knows when seven-year-olds play basketball, as soon as they get the basketball, mommy starts screaming, coach starts screaming, spectators start screaming, refs start screaming. And so the kid usually don't shoot. He just in a circle, right? And then he'll do something, and they'll say, why did you do that? It's 50 people screaming at him. And so I'll say to him, son, tell me what were you thinking. I just want to know your train of thought. And so I said to the guy, what would you have done earlier, and what were you thinking? He said, I'm glad you asked the question. If I could do anything different or earlier, I would have embraced the adversity, and I would have shifted my attitude a lot earlier, and I believe I would have been a better man as a result of it. And the thing about life, I ask myself every Sunday a couple of questions, right? And the questions go, if this was the last week of my life, how would I live it? If this was the last week I had to be a father to my two children, what type of father would I be? If this was the last week I had to be a husband to my wife, what type of husband would I be? If this was the last week I had to serve, like with the work I feel I've been called to do, like, you know, people look at it as motivation, and I get pretty riled up because I feel I've been blessed to be able to do it. But at the core of what I do, I firmly believe I've been trusted to serve. I'm a servant at heart. I love people because of something that happened in my life a long time ago with people that changed the trajectory of my life and people coming into my life, seeing things in me when I couldn't see it in myself, and it affected me in such a way that I still live my life according to that even to this day, and I'm a man, and I got two children and a whole family. But it happened when I was seven years old. And so when I ask myself these questions, we do work at the homeless shelters, and an amazing thing happens, 
right? It's a transitional program. And so you come in, you got to have a job, you got to have a start date, exit date, you got goals, dreams, and aspirations, right? And so it's a staff there. We've adopted three homeless shelters. And so I usually do work with the children, teenagers, and I ask them one question. What do you want out of this thing called life? Like when it's all said and done, right, when they get through telling you how cute, how cool you are, right, how strong you are, like when it's all said and done, what do you want from this thing called life? Number one answer, I want to be rich, Mr. Johnson. I said, I hope you get it. I said, I hope you go out and you crush it. You make an honest living because if I was coming from under a bridge, I never want to struggle again either. If I watch my mother struggle on the street, I want to be rich too. I want to put food on the table too. I get it. I said, but be careful because it's very easy in life to have achievement and not fulfillment. I said, be careful in life. It's very easy to become a public success, but behind closed doors, you're a private failure, not because you didn't have the talent or the skill set. You had the talent and the skill set, but your talent and your skill set took you to a place that your character can sustain you because you wasn't developing. And so the game of football is so lovely and beautiful for me because I always viewed it kind of like I viewed a stage. It was a platform that got provided that I could cultivate a certain level of excellence if I approached the process of it in the right way. And one day when I stopped playing it, it would be certain things I could extract from it to apply to other areas and aspects of my life to make me somewhat of a decent human being, right? Outside of the fact that I love inflicting violence on people and not getting in trouble for it. Like, I loved every bit of it, right? But when I was young, the expectation where I grew up was extremely low. I was born to a mother at 16 years old, right? My family tree, I had a grandmother drop out third grade, grandfather dropped out fifth. They had 16 children out of 16, three graduated high school, and one just so happened to be my mother. I was being raised in a two-bedroom home, and there was 14 of us living there. And so when I said I wanted to go to the NFL, it was kind of like, yeah, Inky, we hear you, but the family has a track record of failure. Right, like nobody has really made it past high school. And so we hear you, but we're really not taking you serious. Outside of that, we can't afford to pay to put you in organized sports. And so the excuses were coming, and I wanted to know if me and my three younger cousins wanted to do it and do it for real, could we be committed to the process of it even when we didn't have the resources? And so just making it to the NFL for superficial, materialistic, it wasn't deep enough for me. My question was always, could I become committed to the process of what I was doing without being emotionally attached to the results of what I was doing? In other words, if I didn't get what I thought I was going to get, can I still show up and be just as dedicated, just as committed, and just as on fire as I was at day one? Right? Because everybody knows how to respond when they get what they're supposed to get and things go the way it's supposed to go. I think that's the reason the quote says you judge the character of a person not by where they stand in times of comfort and convenience. You judge the character of a person by where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. You got some of the most brilliant people on the face of this planet. When they hit adversity, they can't fight themselves out of a paper bag. And it's not even that they don't have the will. Like, they got it. It's that the perspective about the adversity isn't right. And I firmly believe perspective drives performance every day of the week. How an individual view what they do will always affect how they do what they do. And so I went to my cousins, and they were like, Inc., we want to go to the NFL, but we can't play organized sports. I was like, cool, let's just start practicing in the street. They was like, street? I'm like, yeah, you said you want it. They was like, yeah, we don't want it like that. I'm like, yeah, but if you want it, we could just practice in the street every single night until we get the opportunity to do it on grass. Let's just go light pole to light pole. It's simple. If we want it, we will commit to the process of it. They were like, all right, cool. We start doing it in the street every single day, bloody, scarred up, getting after it, right? Until one night, a blue pickup truck came down the street, and it changed our life. And we're in the street every night. Street lights pop on 10 minutes before we got to go in the house. And a blue pickup truck is coming down the street, and I'm waving the truck by. And I'm like, come on, man, I got a couple moves I want to put on these young jokers before we go in the house. And the guy's driving extremely slow. And he gets out of the truck, and it's the first white guy we ever saw in our neighborhood. Drug dealers are running. They think the guy's the police. Guy's the nicest guy in the world. And he walks over between the game and he says to us, would you all like to play football on grass? I'm like, brother, I would love that. This street getting rough. Right? He said, go in the house. Get your parents. Let me talk to them. My mother was at work. My mother worked a double shift at Wendy's from the time I was a kid to the time I was in college. 
I went and got my uncle, JJ. I said, will you please come and talk to this gentleman? Uncle said, sure. Uncle came outside, got extended his hand. He said, hey, man, my name is Trey Hurst. He said, I don't even supposed to be over here. Drop the kid home after practice, a couple blocks over. I was just leaving the neighborhood. I see these knuckleheads playing tackle football in the street. He said, I run a program across town. I think if you bring the boys out, sign them up, be a great opportunity for them, make it really help them. My uncle responded, sir, we greatly appreciate it. He said, but I hate to inform you, we just don't have the money for anything like that at this moment. The coach, without any hesitation, says, I tell you what, you bring them to the park tomorrow, I'll sign them up, I'll pay for it with my own money. I tap my cousin's leg. I said, man, he hasn't even seen my spin move yet, man. I said, what type of guy is this, right? And he hadn't seen us play. And the next day, my uncle brought us to the park, and I would soon find out he wasn't just paying for me and my three younger cousins. He was paying for kids all across Atlanta, right? And I was intrigued by it because nobody had ever done anything for us like that. But I wanted to understand what drove him. He had a company, he had a successful construction company. He didn't have to be a little league coach, right? And so I wanted to understand what made you sacrifice for others the way that you sacrificed for others when you didn't have to sacrifice for others. And I'll be in the park 9 p.m. running, right, doing drills, chasing this dream to go to the NFL, mother pulling up, got her car lights on, I'm out there doing the W drill, right, running laps, waiting on her to get off. Right, until one night she said to coach, I can't make it. Can you please take Inky home? And we're riding in this truck and we get to my house, 125 Warren. And I get out of the truck and he says to me, all right, Inky, I'll see you tomorrow at practice. I said, all right, coach, can I ask you one question? He said, sure, Ink, what you got? I said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Opened his door, got out of his truck, walked around, stood directly in front of me. He said, son, I love you. First man to ever tell me love me. He said, what you got, Ink? I said, why do you live life the way that you live it? He said, I'm going to share something with you, and I don't want you to ever forget it. And in his simplicity, it was yet profound, and all he said to me was, as long as you can live your life and make sure that somebody else's life is okay, he said, son, your life will always be okay. And he got in his truck, and he left. And he would preach to me every morning, submission of ego, submission of pride. And when he said it in that moment, it made me realize, man, if I can annihilate my ego and my pride, not the pride that I represent my family every day and my legacy is on the line, right, or my career that I'm attached to, not that type of pride, but the pride that allows the individual's emotions to overpower their intelligence, the pride that comes before the great fall, like it says in a good book, the pride that comes before the great fall that destroys everything. If I can destroy that and annihilate that, when I face levels of adversity and opposition that stop most people, I would supersede them, not because I'm something special, but my perspective about what I'm going through would be different, and I'll be able to process it differently, but most importantly, use it to add value to the lives of others. And when he said it, it, it hit me in such a way to where I love the, the element of football to where when my guys got tired and I could go to them and say, brother, rent my passion if you're not strong enough to possess your own. Like playing on Saturdays, it was cool, but what I miss about the game, I miss the fact that I was a part of something with a group of people and what we were working for was greater than any one of us. I miss that element of it. I miss when we showed up and said, brother, X's and O's don't matter. It's about the Jimmys and the Joes. It's about the people, right? I miss that element of it. When we show up at 5 a.m. and had to run 131 tens starting at 5 a.m. and guys would get on the line and complain, complain, complain. Run the 131 tens. Come break it down. Complain, complain. Go into the locker room. Complain, complain. And I would say, why come into an environment, complain about being in an environment, but still do the work? I said, if you don't care that much, go home. I said, but most importantly, let's make a pact. Let's never complain about something that we're not willing to change. We're sitting in lockers, and guys are complaining, and they got their own AC unit in the locker. Like, you got your own AC unit. You get brought shoes. Right? You got gear. You got a barber. You got a smoothie section. And you're complaining because you're getting put outside of your comfort zone. And you're complaining because something that you asked for, and now you're being pushed to the limit for greatness and excellence, and you didn't know what you signed up for, and so now you don't want it. So it was never about being the greatest and pushing yourself to it. Now it's about your validation and you getting what you want. And then you see guys start dropping like flies, quitting. Mother sacrificed, worked two jobs to put clo clothes on their back, food on the table, they quit. You see guys say, man, this is what I want. Get to college, quit. 
And I watched a cornerback one day, and he was about to quit. And I'm like, I'm sick of this. Man, I'm not letting another guy on this team quit while I'm here. And he come into the locker room, prima donna. He's throwing his gear into his bag, little prima donna. I quit. I let him get done with his theatrics. Turned around. I said, man, tell me you're not about to quit. He said, yeah, ain't come about to quit. I said, why? He said, I can't take the way coach is talking to me. I said, how old are you again? I said, you're not eight, right? He was like, yeah. I said, when did you start playing? He said, when I was a kid. I said, coach wasn't present when you was a kid. When you were a kid, it was about pure passion and pure love for what you wanted to do. He was like, yeah. I said, so this is about validation. This is about when you do what you're supposed to do, you want somebody to say, oh, you did it right. Here's a cookie. Right, yeah, yeah. You can check into the hand and give you a warm cookie. Right, this is about validation. Right, this is not about preserving your legacy and everything you touch. You do it in such a way that they say, if it's going to be done, that's the way it should be done. This is about when people try to disrespect you, and you say, man, I'm not even playing an ego game with you, and I'm not letting you put me on an emotional roller coaster. I'm going to still give you excellence when I'm in your presence. Right? I can't go to my son's game, and I'm mad at somebody because I'm involved in an ego war, and I'm trying to cheer for my son, but I'm mad at some. I can't, I can't put forth excellence in that way. It's not about that. Every single day, my legacy is on the line. Every single day, when somebody sees my son one day and he introduces himself, I want them to say, son, you're good because of what your father stood for. They said they asked Coretta Scott King a question years after Martin Luther King passed, and the question they posed to her, Sean, was, why after he died, why didn't you ever remarry? She said, it's easy. It'll be an automatic downgrade. And so when I look at a person, I'm like, man, you look great, but is it easy to replace you? Like with the energy and the passion that you bring into an environment, the trip part about life, it's people that's been going away from the world a year. And people are like, man, he's dead. I didn't even know he was dead. And then it's people, if they're not in your presence for 30 minutes, you're like, man, somebody go find Jason. Somebody go find Sarah. Because of the energy and the passion and the zeal that they bring into an environment. The thing that grinds my gears is when you see people, like people tend to complain and not appreciate things until they almost lose them. Or when you see somebody, they show up in an environment and they count the hours and they don't make the hours count. Or you see people and they don't realize somebody that woke up this morning, they're not going to live to see the night. Right? You see it all around. Life is happening. Adversity is happening. And you see people that just walk around, and because of success, they feel as if I can't get touch. Right? They feel as if nothing can happen to me. And I told a kid, son, wake up, call. News flash. Life touches everybody. I said, I can guarantee you how strong you are, how beautiful you are. I can get, my grandmother so, told it to me this way. Inky, either you're in the midst of adversity, just came out of adversity, or you're about to head into some adversity. So you better be prepared for it either way. And so I lived my life in such a way, I was telling him about this concept of this book that's called Last Arrow, right, by this pastor. And he was talking about when you do things, don't save your last arrow, right? Don't live life on reserve. Don't go into an environment thinking I'm just going to preserve myself and not give everything I got to it. The thing that saved my life. The thing that saved my life, September 9th, 2006, the third best day of my life, outside of marrying my wife and having my two children. It was one of the most beautiful moments that was set up for this dream that was about to manifest, and it turned into a tragic moment that birthed something more beautiful than I could ever imagine. I'm in the position to where my dream is about to manifest. I got the paperwork by all accounts that say my dream of being an NFL draft pick is about to happen. It said it, top of the paper set, projected top 30 draft pick as a cornerback. They told me, all your hard work, all you got to do is play your next 10 football games, Inky, you're an automatic multimillionaire. I'm at Tennessee, and there was gravy train. I'm like, man, you get anything you want. And all you got to do is be a person of your word? All you got to do is have character? All you got to do is go to class, you show up, you do your work, you be on time, and you do the things you say you're going to do? That's gravy for me. When I first stepped on campus, they said, what's your plan? I said, it's simple. Graduate in three years and go to the NFL. And I'm sitting in the team room on my third year and I'm watching film. It was two big projector streams. And I'm on track to graduate in three years and I'm on track to go to the NFL after my third year. And I come out in a silly football game. 
I've been in a lot harder collision, a silly game. And I go and make one tackle at the end of the game. The game is about to be over. If I make this tackle, the game is about to end. Hour later, I find myself in the emergency room and I'm fighting for my life. Wake up the next day, everything I work for is gone. And I go back and I trace the day because I wanted to find out, did I do anything that made this happen? Because I'm an extremely like detailed guy, I study every facet of things, right? And I went back and I said, man, what time did I wake up? Right? Every Saturday, we wake up at the hotel. I'm like, what time did I wake up? I used to journal. I said, man, I woke up at the same time. I said, man, what time did I do my push-ups? I was like, man, I did my push-ups at the same time. And man, when I got to the stadium, what time did I go out for my pregame drills? Man, I did them at the same time. Even listen to the same pregame music. Phil Collins, I can feel it. Come. That was my joint, right? <laughs> Coming in the air tonight, right? <laughs> listen to the same song, right? And for some reason, when I went to make this tackle, I lost everything I've been working for. Even further, when we broke the huddle, I said to my teammates, I hope they throw it my way. When the play was unfolding and I saw the quarterback aiming my way to throw the ball to the receiver, I said to myself, thank you, God, I got exactly what I asked for. I got exactly what I asked for. And I'm running to make the tackle, and as soon as I hit the guy, something different had happened to me that had never happened to me before in my life. As soon as I hit him, it seemed as if every breath immediately left my body. My body went completely limp. I fell to the ground. I blacked out. It had never happened to me before. When I opened my eyes, my teammates ran over to me. They said, Ink, get up. Let's rock. Let's go. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up. I said, I can't. I can't move. I said, there's a shock going from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. I can't feel anything. The shock eventually left, and it stayed in my right arm and hand. They brought the spine board out. They put me on the spine board. They're willing me off the field. We get to the ambulance. My father's standing there. And I say to my father as I'm lying on the spine board, I said, Pops, I got him, right? He said, yeah, son, but I think you got the worst part of this one. They rolled me up in the ambulance. They said, Ink, we'll take you over, run a couple tests. Football, things happen. Sure, you'll be fine. They take me over. They run their tests. They bring me back into a room. My mother comes in, kisses me, says a prayer, cracks a joke. Said, Ink, you'll be fine. It's football. Things happen. She's going to exit the room, and as she steps out, as soon as she steps out, her footsteps coming from the opposite side. When I turn to look, it's the head doctor. He's doing a little light jog, and he's screaming. And he's saying, guys, guys, get in here. We got to rush him back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I remember looking at him, and I'm like, man, you can't use another word? <laughs> right? My like, brother, use a synonym, like die? Right? He's like, yeah, die. I'm like, like, die, die. Away from me or die. He's like, yeah, die. I said, what happened? He said, you ruptured your subclavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. He said, we got to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. He said, oh, I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. So let's go. The next morning I woke up, top three most embarrassing moments of my life. And it didn't have anything really to do with football. Like football, grand scheme of life, football is that big. Like average career in the NFL, two and a half, three years. Like we know it as National Football League. Guys that play it know it as not for long, right? Like careers are just not that long. But when I was sitting there, it was like people were coming into my room and they were reading me my eulogy because I couldn't play this game. And I'm sitting there, and I got cut six times down my left thigh, one time across the left side of my neck, one time across the right, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, 350 staples, banished me from my neck to my knees. I'm like, man, I thought it was an artery. And they're like, yeah, I went in to repair the artery. We noticed you had torn all the nerves in your brachial plexus. Your nerve roots that come from your spine, they control your shoulder, arm, hands, fingers. It said it goes into like if you were plugging something up in the wall, it goes into your spine that way. But th what happened is at the point of contact, you ripped them all out and it can't go back in. So you had a brachial plexus avulsion and you ruptured your main artery. And they said to me, you'll be in the hospital for the next 40 to 60 days. 
And I grabbed my father's shoulder and I started walking laps around the hospital because I had to get my leg back going so I could learn how to walk all over again. And on the third day, me and my father and my mother was downstairs. We were getting in the university's van. And the doctor came over and he said to me, Inky, you broke a record. I said, what record? He said, the average person from that surgery of that magnitude would be here 40 to 60 days. He said, you left on the third day. I was like, man, no disrespect. I didn't know I was supposed to accommodate your limitations. I didn't know y'all said 40 to 60. I was just supposed to chill and say 40 to 60. And as we were driving back to campus, they said, Inky, we're going to unenroll you. I'm going to send you back to Atlanta. Let you take a break. He said, something traumatic has happened to you. I said, no, nah, man, I'm not going home. They said, yeah, but you need to take a break and process it. I said, can you please order me a Dunjoy sling and a Velcro strap? I need to go back to practice. They said, yeah, ain't some traumatic. You just need to. I said, I'm not going home. I said, I'm going back to practice with my teammates. I said, I'm going to go back to class this week. I'm going to go to disability services this week. I was right-hand dominant, can no longer use my right arm and hand. I had to learn how to write all over again with my left hand. I'm not going home. I said, that wasn't a part of my contract. They said, what contract? My life contract. It never said, I might graduate unless I get injured. I never said to my teammates, I'm going to give you everything I got until something goes wrong, and then you might see a different version of me, and I might never show up and be there for you again. I never said, I'm going to come to practice unless I get a paralyzed right arm and hand, then I might not show up and I might not come to meetings. I never said to my mother, I'll be the first one in this family to graduate college and break the generational curse unless I get injured and I can't play the game of football. I said, I'm going to graduate. I said, I'm going to be there for my teammates. And so in essence, you got to take my life before you take my drive. I wasn't working just to be a great football player. I want to be a great man. I want to be a great father for my children. I want to be a great husband for my wife. I want to be a great servant in the world. I don't want when adversity or rain comes, I'm the guy, I was great before the adversity, but the moment the adversity hit, I never turned back to true form. I don't want to be that person that's great when everything is going all good, but when something goes wrong, they flee and they want nothing to do with it. I want to be that person that's going to show up rain, sleet, or snow, and they're going to give you everything they got. Right? I was working so one day when the game of football stopped, my arm and my hand was paralyzed. My mindset wasn't. My arm and my hand got paralyzed. My drive wasn't. My commitment wasn't. Right? I'm talking concrete commitment. I'm talking a commitment that says I am going to stay true to what I said I would do long after the mood that I've set it in has left. Right? Because character is not something we inherit. Character is something we got to wake up every single day. We got to fight and we got to build it. Right? In the midst of adversity, in the midst of challenges, in the midst of successes, in the midst of failures, we got to get up every single day and we got to fight for peace. Right? We got to fight for happiness. We got to fight for joy. Like I told a guy, I said, you think life just going to make it, give you happiness on the platter and say, I heard you wanted to be happy. Here you go, FedEx package overnight. No. We got to get up. We got to fight for that. Right? We got to fight for joy. We got to fight for peace. Right? The worst thing in the world is when you see somebody that's amazing, like talented, skill set out of this world, and they don't have any passion. Life has robbed them. Right? They're a walking zombie. Right? They're just a shell. They get up, they go to work, they do what they do, they come back home, wake up the next day, repeat, do it all over again. Like I asked a guy once, I said, man, what do you love about what you do? He said, well, I go to work, I make my money, I come home, put food on the table, roof over my family's head. I said, that's great, that's awesome, man. I said, but if there's one thing you can point to and say, I love it. He said, nothing, man. I go to work, I make my money, do what I do. I said, it's great. I said, but man, that sounds painful. I said, when you think about the average life expectancy is 77. Average person retires around 67. So the average person works somewhere around 50 years to be free for 11. That's a raw deal. Right? Like, it means nothing. I just want one thing from people. Right? I'm not one of these guys that travel around the world and try to tell people how to do what they do. I wouldn't disrespect you in that way. But I do understand this about life. People don't burn out because of what they do. People burn out because life makes them forget why they do it. Like the passion that they first had when they said, man, I'm with you. I'm going to give you everything I got, whether that be sports, whether that be business, whether that be a family. Right? The drive that they have when they first start something, then life comes knocking. And they say, man, I'm going to stay committed to it. Right? I'm going to be a better person. It's like at the beginning of every year. 
right? What do people have? Resolution. Then late February, you see them with the cupcakes, right? And you're like, man, what happened to that resolution? They're like, man, bump that. It's not that deep, right? I just want people to never allow life to make them forget why they do what they do, right? To never allow life to rob you of your passion, to never allow life to rob you of your joy, your peace, your happiness. Not only do you owe it to yourself, you owe it to those that you're connected to, right? I want to close with this story. It was a story about a young guy that did extremely well in business, crushed it, right? Met another gentleman. They did extremely well together, crushed it. They got toward the latter years of their life. They became terminally ill. They put them in a facility to die, right? Kind of like a hospice facility. And in this facility, every single day, they had a common area. It's where they would come out every single day, joke, play, have fun, have a big time. Guys got pretty cool. They asked one of the nurses. They said, hey, me and my guy hit it off. Can you put us in the same room? She said, cool, no problem. She put them in the same room every single day, bring them the same thing to eat, same thing to drink. They would eat their food, drink their water. One of the guys, his bed was to the left, your right. One of the guys to my right, your left. The guy to my left, your right, bed was by a window. So every single day, his buddy would say to him, hey, man, tell me what do you see out that window? The guy would get the strength, lift himself up, look out of the window, and he would say, man, I see a beautiful skyline. Say, man, I see beautiful children walking, playing, beautiful couples walking, holding hands, beautiful flowers. His buddy would say, thank you so much, man. One day, guy with the bed by the window died. Nurse comes in, she's prepping him, and as she's taking him out, his buddy says, hey, nurse, can you do me a favor? He says, sure, what is it? He said, whenever you put my guy wherever you got to put him, can you come back and will you please put my bed by the window? I want the opportunity to see what he used to tell me about that really helped me in my situation. He says, sure. She came back two days later, brought him something to eat, of course, something to drink. He gets the strength, lifts himself up, looks out of that same window, and the only thing he sees is a big brick wall. And he's yelling and screaming, nurse, nurse, come in. Nurse comes running in. She says, what is it? Looks at the window, looks at the nurse. He said, you remember my guy, right? She says, sure. She said, he used to tell me about this beautiful skyline. Can we please get this big brick wall removed? She looked at him, and she posed a question. She said, you didn't know. He said, no, ma'am, no what? She said, you didn't didn't know? You really didn't know? He said, no, ma'am, no what? She said, he was blind. She said, he couldn't have seen that even if he wanted to. She said, you didn't know every day he did it because he knew it brought you joy. Every day he did it because he knew it brought you peace. Every day he did it because he knew it brought you happiness. He was about to die himself, but here you had a guy that lifted up, looked out of a window, painted a picture that he couldn't even see because he knew it served as a blessing to somebody else. And so as I come to a close today, I have to pose the question, why do we do what we do and where is it taking us? Like, what's the GPS that's on the end of our decisions and our choices every single day? Like, when the clock stops, when it's all said and done, like, what would they say about us? What would they say about our legacy? Like, will will an extension of us still be in the world because of the work that we once did? Like, the most beautiful thing in the world is when I was at my grandmother's funeral, and a lady came in, and she tapped me on my shoulder. I'm crying like a baby. And she walks up to speak on stage, and she spoke about an encounter she had with my grandmother when my grandmother got in Grady Hospital in Atlanta, and she became a nurse from our program, from our homeless program. And I tapped my little cousin, and I said, that's what life's about. And he said, what do you mean? eh?" I said, that's legacy. That's an extension of the work that we've done. Some people, the only thing they got to show, right, like they're so broke, the only thing they got is money. That's it. They don't have anybody they can point to and say, you know that young man over there, man? When he was going through something, I was able to come alongside him, and I was there for him. You know that young lady over there, when she went through a rough patch, I was able to come alongside her, and I was there for her. I challenge people all the time. Every single day, I challenge people to do one random act of kindness. Whether that be stopping and encouraging somebody, words don't cost a thing. Being nice don't cost a thing. Whether that be being in line behind somebody, paying for something, like it don't cost a thing. Right? Just one random act of kindness. So when we get to that point and the clock stops, our existence, our life, 
it means something more than materialistic and superficial. That's my time. God bless you. Thank you.